Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, I'm Brady Ryan, manager at Comotion Labs, and this is our fourth installment of our brand new series focused on hardware entrepreneurship. Uh, sorry for everyone that's heard this a thousand times before, but we have a lot of new attendees, so I'm going to go through it again. Uh, Comotion Labs is UW's multi industry incubation environment for Seattle and UW's innovation community. We provide critical infrastructure like desks, wet lab space, and prototyping space, as well as education, mentoring, and networking opportunities for our startups. We think of it as the best version of co-working available where we do everything we can to support early stage startups. We don't take any equity and we don't want any of your IP. We just exist to provide co-working and incubation for the best startups in Seattle, uh, regardless of if they spin out of a lab at UW or out of someone's garage. We have three incubators at UW, uh, including my favorite one, the hardware incubator that we just opened up a couple of weeks ago. Um, we heard from the community that hardware startups in Seattle need more love and resources here, and we're happy to jump in and join the fight. So co-working at Hardware Hall, uh, we have both desks for all of your programming and bookkeeping and emailing, as well as workbenches for when you need a wrench on your prototype. We have shared equipment like a suite of 3D printers, SLA printers, a laser cutter, a circuitry rework area, and a bunch of hand tools, conference rooms, phone booths, coffee, uh, all of that good stuff. Um, and we're also building a ton of relationships with service providers, design shops, suppliers, distributors around the region. Um, and we'll do what we can to help you raise money, prototype, and learn what you need. So we opened on the 1st of September and we have two startups in the space now. This is our very soft opening. Uh, we're gonna keep it at two for a little while while we iron out the wrinkles and get stuff finalized. Uh, and we're gonna ramp up really slowly because of COVID. So we wanna keep everybody safe and productive. Uh, we do currently have a pretty healthy wait list, but if your startup uh, will be needing space in the next few months, please do reach out. Uh, one note, last week we heard there was a big appetite in the community for something like a Seattle hardware Slack channel for everybody to connect and network. Um, great news, uh, Hans, who I'll be introducing next, already has a Discord server that fits that need perfectly. Um, I sent out the email, I sent out the info in an email earlier, and we'll put that link in the chat box, uh, but please join. It should be a great space to network and learn more. Uh, next, I'll introduce Hans. Uh, Hans is the leader of the, a fantastic meetup group called the IoT Hub, and he is as well networked in the space and as helpful as anyone I've met. Uh, if anyone here doesn't know Hans, do yourself a favor and reach out. Go ahead, Hans. Thank you, Brady. Um, as uh, Brady mentioned, I lead the uh, Seattle-based IoT Hub meetup group. Uh, we're a community of uh, technology people, entrepreneurs. Uh, and we have a number of corporate uh, innovation folks as well. Uh, industry experts, executives, and students who want to connect, share, and learn how IoT and Industry 4.0 type technologies will shape our lives, communities, jobs, and industries. Our members represent technology, uh, industrial, and manufacturing companies. Many are based here locally and range from startups to uh, big uh, global industrial companies. Uh, the, the community has been around for about four and a half years, and we just passed 3,800 members. Uh, about a month ago, uh, which makes us one of the largest IoT and industry 4.0 focused communities in the country. Our meetups cover technology topics that you'd expect from an uh, IoT meetup group, uh, edge computing, 5G, edge to cloud, embedded AI, um, and whatever buzzword you can think around in this space. Um, to understand how the I IoT technologies will shape uh, industries and jobs. Uh, we also devote a bunch of time to industry 4.0 topics where IoT products um, are uh, helping improve business processes and uh, making uh, uh, the world around us a bit smarter, more efficient and productive. Topics that uh, we've uh, included and uh, they tend to get some of our highest um, attendees are include uh, smart manufacturing, uh, autonomous transportation, smart cities, digital supplies, chains, predictive maintenance. Um, we also cover uh, how uh, as a service business models and what that means for uh, manufacturers who are uh, jumping into IoT uh, with new revenue models. Many of our members uh, who are IoT are startups uh, and they need to build some sort of connected widget as part of their value proposition. Uh, the good news is that, uh, according to Bloomberg, investments in hardware startups last year um, represented over 40% of all VC dollars. The bad news is only 24% of hardware startups make it to 
this second round of funding, which compares to 46% for all tech startups. 97% um, of them fail altogether, which again compares to 70% for all tech companies. So it doesn't look very good if you're a hardware entrepreneur. And to make matters worse, our ecosystem here for hardware startups is not as good as the software ecosystem. Um, so to help address this, um, we started this series uh, as part of our meetup, and it's how I met uh, Brady. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, be partnering with Brady and uh, Commotion Labs to uh, bring this uh, set of uh, meetups to you guys. Um, the goal is to try and build a, um, an, a hardware ecosystem that's deep, as deep and wide as um, the software startup ecosystem that we have here in Seattle. So hope good luck to all of us. Um, you can check out our community on meetup.com. Um, just look for IoT Hub in Seattle. There's a few IoT hubs around the globe, um, but uh, we're the only ones here in Seattle. Um, next week, we're hosting uh, Len Jordan, who's uh, uh, the managing part, is a managing director at um, Madrona Venture Group, uh, Seattle's largest VC firm. Um, he's going to be sharing um, their lessons learned from uh, investing in IoT industry for and uh, uh, connected hardware startups. Um, he's also going to talk a bit about what uh, the current state of funding looks like in the age of COVID and um, what they view um, this space looks like like in terms of investments in the future. Um, as Brady, Brady mentioned, we have the Discord server. Um, we've been trying to figure out a way to substitute our in-person networking and uh, this seemed like a decent solution. It's used by a lot of open source hardware um, communities. Um, so, you know, give it a try. Let us know uh, what you think, um, but hopefully it will be a decent uh, studio we can post. And, um, if you're interested in speaking, please reach out. Um, we're always looking for speakers. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, some final announcements before we get started. Uh, this is a series. So next week we have Ryan Shimizu, the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Igor Institute, and he's presenting hardware versus software is a false choice. Hardware enabled services is the future. Uh, all of these fundamentals for hardware startups presentations are on the Comotion website under lab slash startup training videos. Uh, we've done a lot of other speaker series as well that are available both there and on our YouTube channel. So if you've got some free time, check them out. Uh, for the full schedule uh, of our events and to register for future events, it's comotion.uw.edu slash events. Um, and lastly, use the chat box. We've been having fantastic interactions in the live chat over the last few weeks, uh, and I want to keep that going. I've been seeing people use it to network. Uh, you know, so use that network. Tell people what you're up to. Tell people what you're stuck on. Ask for help. Um, it's been cool to see the community uh, happening in the chat box. So today we have Phnom Bagley is here to present Good Design, Bad Design. Uh, Phnom is a French industrial designer, creative director, and co-founder at Nonfiction, a design firm based in San Francisco. She spent 15 years designing cutting edge hardware in audio, wearables, neurotech, biotech, luxury, fashion, packaging, sports, and aerospace. Uh, she's done it all and she's done it all quite well. Um, she has designed and led teams at very design uh, consultancies, including IDEO, Lunar, McKinstry, Matter, Fjord, and Lifestyle Design. Phenom's work spans four continents and companies ranging from Fortune 500s to startups. Clients include Intel, Comcast, Facebook, Atari, Halo Neuroscience, and more. She speaks internationally on the subject of design for a better future, covering stories of groundbreaking technologies, science, design, and education. She's a co-host of Future Future, a video series about design and the future of everything. Phnom also teaches industrial design at California College of the Arts and mentors at Founder Institute. Uh, she'll take questions via chat or email, info is on the screen. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. She's happy to answer them as they pop up. And we'll also do questions at the end. Uh, and I will now turn the event over to Phnom. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brady, for the introduction and, and Hans uh, for everything that you do. Uh, thank you, uh, University of Washington, for hosting this. Uh, more information about hardware is what we need. There are so many people passionate about putting out great hardware and we need to support them. Uh, so thank you for, for having me today. So today we're talking about good design, bad design. All of us have experienced things that are great and some that not so great. Um, so why am I talking today? Um, so I'm Phnom, I'm an industrial designer. Some people might call that hardware designer. Uh, I also have a background in aerospace architecture 
uh, I used to design, um, you know, spacecraft and rovers and habitats for the moon and Mars. Uh, I quit that career about 15 years ago, and I'm actually currently coming back to it. I'm a futurist. I specifically design things for the future, whether it's the short future or the long-term future. I'm an educator uh, teaching at, um, I, I was teaching at um, uh, California College of the Arts. I'm also a craftswoman. As much as I look to the future, I like to look to the past and how things have been fabricated uh, traditionally and how they are today so I can really think about how they can be tomorrow. So I run a company called Nonfiction, and the reason why we call it Nonfiction is because I'm only interested in doing things that will actually launch, that people will actually experience one day. And, um, and we turn science fiction into reality for a better future. That better future is very important to me because for many years, I was designing a lot of things that, you know, eventually would land, would, would, you know, land in a landfill, and, and I didn't really see a point to it. So, so we'll talk a little bit later about what that means. So we service four continents uh, today and expanding to six. Um, this is the kind of companies we work for. Um, you might recognize a couple of those uh, logos. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without my team, right? Uh, nonfiction team is just a bunch of very strange people with very interesting backgrounds. Uh, I've never looked at any of these people's resumes. I, it's all about what they have in their heads and what they can do with their hands. So the subject today, um, good design, bad design. What is that? So good design, bad design. So, so these, these are the subjects we're gonna cover today. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go one, one by one, 12 subjects about what good design is about. And I'll, I'll illustrate each of these with a lot of images of the projects we've been working on. So what is good design? To me, it's the perfect balance between appearance, value, and function in order to make things relatable, harmonious, and useful. And there are certain aspects of each of these categories that you know, have to look into. Uh, for example, for appearance, you have to think about market fits, aesthetics and trends, branding, durability, and intuitive use. For function, you have to think about real reliability, um, durability, ergonomics, user experience, and pleasure. For value, you have to think about the user or the purchaser, which might be two different people the company and the strategic partners you, you work with, the future of the industry, of humanity, or the planet. So to me, the first point about good design is that good design is designed for good, right? You've probably been uh, exposed to the United Nations uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the goals that were uh, presented in 2015, and basically the UN gave us 15 years to try to solve all of these problems, having to do with poverty, with inequality, with uh, water quality, etc. And then this has actually become a requirement to work with my company. Uh, you have to check at least one of those boxes, uh, or we can help you check one of them. Um, because I don't want to design just, you know, another box that does the same thing that's been doing for the last 10 years. We want to think about the future. We want to think about the long-term impact of what it means to do hardware. And so, as I said earlier, we're very, very, very much focused on the future and the future of many industries. We're on the future of transit, autonomy, of smart cities, of senses, the future of home, of personalization, of childhood, of pleasure, etc. So point number two is about um, good design being lengthy and costly. You know, I, I live here in San Francisco, you know, right next to Silicon Valley. And, you know, most people here work, work in, um, you know, the tech industry and as in digital tech. And they really have a hard time understanding why hardware takes so long and costs so much money. Uh, this is a graph you might have seen before. You know, everybody wants things to be done fast, cheap, and high quality. Well, that's not going to happen, but, um, you know, you can, you can compromise a little bit. But if you do something cheap and fast, it's most likely going to end up poor quality. If you're doing something fast and high quality, it's most likely going to cost a lot of money. If you do something cheap and high quality, it's going to be slow. 
So the rule of thumb of you know how much it costs to develop hardware, um, based on my experience, is if you want to put out a high quality product, consumer electronics, about hand size of a new design, it's going to take about two years and two million dollars, and you know with a bunch of caveats that I see on the right side. So if you have new branding, uh, basic packaging, you know no exotic materials, no uh, custom app, uh, no consumables, no paid marketing, that's that's two million dollars. If you want to add Add any of these, the, the number is going to go up real quick. So a lot of the times, you know, as, as someone who runs a design firm, uh, I have to compete against people who cost a lot less money. And a lot of these people are novices, right? They, they, the, the difference uh, there, there are many differences besides the hourly rate. Uh, the efficiency, a lot of these people will probably come up with a, a solution very quick and you'll probably have to redo the entire thing anyway. So, so working with professionals, you actually get to get to a solution immediately. Ability to anticipate future problems, that's probably the biggest point. You know, when you design hardware, it's not just a shape, it's not just a color, it's not just, you know, whatever trend it follows, it's about what kind of problems can I anticipate in the process of putting this to mass manufacturing? Uh, the ability to solve technical problems with other teams, you know, working with technical teams, working with marketing teams, with sales teams, etc. And uh, also, all of us come with a network of strategic partners that can support you in developing a high quality product. So yeah, save time, money, and a headache. Um, hire a professional. Next is uh, good design challenges the status quo. So here we're going to get into images. Um, so all of us have owned, you know, many pairs of headphones of many kinds, forms, and you know, scales. Uh, In-ear headphones, on-ear headphones, over-ear headphones, with or without wires. Um, but have you ever seen a pair of headphones that looks like this? Probably not. This is what it looks like on someone's head. Um, this was uh, actually a Seattle-based company called Human Headphones who developed this for. Um, and, and basically the challenge was to create an on-ear headphone without a band. And as you can imagine, that was very complex to do. It required a lot of prototyping. We had 700 plus prototypes trying to figure out what kind of geometry, one fits the components and two fits people's ears. And you know, you've probably seen a lot of ears in your life and there are small ones and fat ones and big ones and weird ones. And, and designing something hard to fit all of these ears is quite complex. And guess when we, when we stopped doing those prototypes? So this was me um, a couple years ago, um, putting on the last prototype that actually fits the ear and doesn't move. After I did a, a handstand, the thing didn't, didn't move at all. Uh, so, so yeah, so now we have this product that you can buy that actually is completely revolutionizing the, uh, the audio industry. Another thing that's really cool about this product is not only the, the, the way you put it on yourself, but also the way you use it, right? Uh, controlling the, the, the volume up and down is done with capacitive touch technology on the outside. Same thing for skipping the sound. Um, and in order to do that, we had to fit very, very, you know, uh, basic shaped components into a very organic shape. As you can imagine, it's, it's very, very difficult. So here I'm gonna you know, sprinkle this whole presentation with a few pro tips that um, may be useful for all of you. So here, you know, as I said, 700 prototypes here. So no design is final until you cut the tool. And uh, final in, um, in the design world, in the engineering world is known as the F word. So next we're gonna talk about uh, good design uh, being a um, good user experience. So this is your brain. Most brains are like this, and this is divided in colors by different cortexes. Um, so different cortexes have different functions for, for, for the body. Um, 
So neuroscientists have, have discovered a while ago that if you stimulate the motor cortex in a, in a very specific way, you can improve performance, you can get results faster, and you can develop skills, physical skills, right? And that can be very great for anybody uh, practicing a sport, learning a new instrument, learning how to dance, et cetera, et cetera. But do you know where your motor cortex is? I didn't know either. So that's why we designed this, um, this product that um, that stimulate uh, the sorry the motor cortex is right here um, where where the where the circle is so so we wanted to design a brain stimulator that people could use so they could go to the gym and learn all of these um, these movement very very fast but we didn't want them to wear a strange brain stimulator on the head right I don't know if you've seen them out there EEG products it's very hard to put on and honestly like because I didn't know where the motor cortex is most people don't anyway um, we 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 decided, you know, what, what, what can we put on people's head at the gym? Well, people at the gym already put headphones on, and the motor cortex happens to be right underneath where a regular band is. So let's put the electrodes right there um, and, and create, you know, a, a product that looks very discreet at the gym. You know, nobody sees that you're stimulating your brain and really enhancing your, uh, your routine. Um, you know, it works with an app. You can control, um, you know, when the stimulation happens, uh, or you, you can also just listen to the, the music through the headphones. And, um, and this has actually been used by uh, professional teams. For example, the USA team in cycling, um, the San Francisco Giants are using it in their training because really the difference between, um, um, you know, silver and gold medal at the Olympics is the technology that's been used during training for the most part. So uh, another thing that was interesting about this project is cost of, of uh, development and, uh, and cost of um, MSRP. So in 2016, Halo Neuroscience came up with the first product called Halo Sport, and it was $750. It was designed specifically for athletes who are okay with spending a lot of money, you know, shaving off that uh, tenth of a second when, uh, when, when they practice a sport. And it had a lot of parts, and you know they didn't make that many product, that many products, and a lot of people thought it was very expensive. And then that's when we came in. We designed Halo Sport 2 in 2019. That was retail for $400. The reason why we're able to to sell it for $400 is because we actually optimized a lot of the hardware. You know, reducing the number of parts, which reduced the number of um, of uh, molds. Uh, we you know uh, try to use uh, old parts. You know, save a bunch of money left and right. Uh, streamline the whole process, streamline the manufacturers, and um, and thanks to the fact that the price went down, we're able to sell to more people. So you know, musicians were able to to come in, people just going to the gym and wanting to get a little bit more better performance, were able to afford this pair of headphones. And then when the product launched, um, that's when Halo actually experienced the best sales ever. So pro tip here, you know, it is possible to to increase the sales by solving design problems in order to grow your audience. Next, we're going to talk about uh, design. Uh, good design is collaborative, right? Uh, good design is not just done by a designer in you know a room with its genius and all that. It's done with um, many teams that work together um, and and really overlap their timelines as well. So uh, you've probably heard of um, Lean Park Development. Uh, basically, it's the practice of overlapping disciplines uh, in order to um, shorten the timelines and mi mitigate risk. Um, that is in contrast to more of a handoff style development. So where you know the strategy team does their thing and then they hand it off to the brand team and then they hand it off to design and then hand it off to engineering. And a lot of the times there's a lot of frustrations that happens when you use a handoff style development because you know people have ideas about how the product should be and should stay the whole process, but because they're not involved be beyond their phase. Um, you know, uh, the, the the product tends to change, tends to change, and um, and and not actually apply the, the the original vision. So, what I always recommend all of our clients is, if possible, when designers are in the room, we want the strategists in the room, we want the mechanical engineer in the room, we want the electrical engineer in the room, every the manufacturer, in order to make decisions together. So we we, you know, so so the whole process looks the same. So. 
Uh, 10 signs of a good team, you know, a good team uh, as you're growing, as you're startup founders and as you're, you're thinking about uh, who to complement your team with, um, these are my observations of what, what makes a good team. One, you have to have a, one clear vision for the company. It has to be one sentence. It has to be one sentence that's just engraved in your brain that you have tattooed on your arm. And uh, it's, you know, it just rolls off the tongue and everybody can talk about it. You have to have one clear leader. You know, this is not um, a system where everybody's voice has the same the same uh, weight. Uh, that, that's, you know, kind of like a recipe for disaster. You have to have a lot of confidence and less ego, right? I've seen so many companies, mostly hardware, just fall apart because of a uh, couple people's egos just getting inflated. Punctuality, independence, and de dependability of everybody involved, especially when your team is small, is absolutely um, primordial. Um, people who enjoy working together, that's, that sounds like a given, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, one thing that has been very, very clear to me uh, while hiring people is that abilities is always more important than the resume. Again, as I said earlier, I've never seen any of our um, uh, employees' resume, but I, I'm very aware of the abilities they have and the potential that they have. Next is honesty, transparency, and clear communication. Pretty straightforward. Uh, questioning everything, then move on quickly. Um, that's something that's very important if you want to be a company that um, is uh, looking to the future and looking to innovate. Uh, you always have to have a safe environment to share ideas and solutions, right? Uh, if there's a very strong voice in the room and some people don't feel comfortable sharing it, uh, sh sharing what they have in their head, that's a problem. And then embrace the weird. Some people are just going to be strange. Some methodologies are just going to uh, appear to be, you know, uh, counterintuitive. It's okay. Just go with it. Next, design is a, a good design is a process, right? Um, there are kind of like two ways that we, did, we, we, we design things. The first uh, phase is conceptual design. Uh, it's basically the process uh, of starting from nothing and ending up with a works like, looks like prototype. And it starts in, in four phases. Um, so you have research and definition, typically with branding, strategy, and industrial design tasks. Uh, you have conceptual design uh, with you know, user experience and industrial design tasks. Uh, same for uh, design refinement, prototype, and testing. And you can read you know, in detail about what these are about. And then you have design for manufacturing, which comes afterwards. And if, if you hold, th this is basically the same process, but integrating uh, mechanical engineering and electrical engineering uh, tasks as well. And obviously, this is like very high level and and not really applicable to any specific company, uh, but it gives you a sense about what kind of tasks are necessary to create, um, you know, a prototype at the end of design for manufacturing. So the pro tip here is uh, that a, a smooth process starts with a clear plan. Uh, but you also have to have the ability to push through issues quickly, and that's through good communication and uh, and uh, you know this this honesty I'm talking about. So back to images, let's talk about how good design saves lives. So we uh, got uh, the um, opportunity to work with a, uh, a company that's developing this really, really cool AR mask for uh, firefighters so they can see through smoke. So basically what it does is that it creates um, uh, green lines uh, at the edges of, um, of a burning building. And um, instead of seeing what you see on the left, which you know on the West Coast, a lot of us has experienced so far uh, in the last two weeks, um, you can actually see the edges of things and, and get through a building a lot quicker and, and be able to, to save lives and, and shaving some seconds from, from, the, from the time you're in a building. And so we developed this by doing a lot of 3D printing, um, you know, figuring out the ergonomics of it and how it fits in a, in a mask, how the components fit together, how it fits with the environment, which is very aggressive and extreme. Um, so here, you know, pro tip is to test often in the intended environment and uh, to revise quickly and to repeat. Uh, that's the best way to, to get to a solution that in, in, includes like many types of uh, technologies. Here we have thermal camera, we have AR, we have um, you know, a very special way for the people to, to actually visualize what's in front of them. And uh, yeah, that was, we could do that very quickly thanks to, thanks to this process. Next, we're going to talk about how good design influences industries. So 
as you as you know, the whole COVID situation has uh, pushed all the designers of, of the world to come up with really great solutions of how to, you know, alleviate um, spread of of the of the virus, uh, whether you're staying at home or you know flying all over. So so here we took on uh, the airline industry, and we um, you know took. Existing technologies like UVC light, you've probably seen that. Uh, this is a technology that that's been used in um, in hospitals for a long time to to basically kill microbes in a room by exposing uh, the entire room to uh, UVC light. Um, we also redesigned the the way the seats are organized in a cabin, uh, in coach, for example. Uh, we also you know, thought about introducing robotics, so there's less contact between uh, humans as well. Um, so that same system you can see in a galley system. Uh, also in the future, as we're you know, thinking about uh, the future of airline in the context of COVID, we, we can also think about other things that are important to us, like comfort and integration of future technologies. In the future, well, you'll be able to call, you know, uh, be, be on a Zoom call or a phone call um, in, in the air. So, um, you know, having privacy and being able to do that in a, in a soundproof room would be, would be useful. Um, you know, having into integrating more the aspect of pleasure and privacy in uh, in the airplane, you know, with a with a bar, for example, would be nice. Completely redefining what first class is. I don't know if you for you, but like a lot of the times I walk into first class and it doesn't seem that luxurious to me, or uh, and 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 pretty low tech. So really integrating a lot of technologies that really create that cocoon like environment with some actual plants and uh, projections and scents and 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 multi sensory experiences that really make the experience, uh, you know, premium, and really completely redefining the bathroom, for example. Why does it have to be this drab, boring, and uh, and um, you know, cheap-looking um, experience? We can we can actually bring a lot of uh, richness to all of this. So pro, pro tip here is to uh, design experiences that relate to people's short and long-term needs. Here, the short-term needs is to um, to deal with the COVID situation. Long-term needs is pleasure in flight. Um, next, we have, you know, good design is responsible, um, you know, talking a little bit, um, coming back to the, the, the sustainable goals that we talked about earlier. Um, so it's not every day that you get to, to design for this guy, uh, Bob Marley. Uh, so the sons and daughters of Bob Marley uh, came to us about 10 years ago uh, when I was working on another studio. And, um, and basically, um, the, the family wanted us to develop a line of, you know, audio products, headphones, speakers, et cetera, that really follow um, the philosophy that their, um, their father came up with. So the way we did is that we dissected uh, the lyrics of Bob Marley songs. Um, you know, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. You, you know, a lot of us know the, uh, the lyrics to these songs. And then that gave way to uh, the decision of creating kind of like a new type of supply chain that is completely, um, you know, eco-friendly. We redefine uh, where the materials come from, how they're being uh, fabricated, how we use them, um, and how we create products from there. So there's a whole library of products, uh, sorry, a whole library of materials, and some of them are proprietary to the brand Marley, and uh, they're being used in the products today. This is a, a product that, you know, designed about 10 years ago. It's a boom box that's covered in a, in a fabric bag. You can see uh, Rohan Marley on the right, one of the sons, uh, carrying it at CES, at, I think 2010. Uh, that was a while ago. And this is this this is a headphone that was designed like 10 years ago and it's still being sold today. I think it's still the bestseller. Uh, same thing, you can see an integration of wood, integration of fabrics, uh, way before Google and all those companies did it. Um, integration of, you know, very, very beautiful, simple shapes into people's lives. Uh, another thing that's really cool about Marley is that, you know, it's it's about giving back um, as much as we give, you know, meaningful, soulful products to, to the consumer. It's, you know, planting trees as we are, you know, cutting them down uh, responsibly. So here, uh, one thing I hear very often when I am um, um, involved with Accelerator Program Preceded and all that is that uh, sustainability always comes as an afterthought. And I really want this to become perhaps the way um, people think about new products in the future. 
Next, we have design, uh, good design changes behaviors. Here we're going to get into the FDA medical products. So this is, you know, a product that doesn't look very aggressive. It's just, you know, a, a watch that you put on your, your hand. And what it's designed for is for people who have essential tremors. So think of Parkinson's disease, but it's actually uh, hitting a different part of the brain. Seven million people in the U.S. suffer from essential tremors, Most, mostly people over 65. But as you can see here, here there are people younger who, who are um, afflicted by this condition. And it's, as you can see, it's very handicapping at home, at work. Um, you know, it hits people's uh, self-esteem in public is very hard for them to eat food in public so you know they, they tend to stay at home so that's why we designed this product that really doesn't look like a medical product you should have seen what it looked like before um, and and something that's extremely easy to use for people who have um, uh, very limited um, you know a control over their hands for for targeting and so it's very easy to use. You, ch you charge it by putting it on this, on this um, charger device here. So I have a very, very cool story about this charging uh, pod here. So we originally had a different design that was really sleek, and, you know, kind of the same, but, but really aligned very beautifully with, uh, with uh, the watch itself. And um, uh, we were testing, we're doing a lot of user testing. You know, you have to do that for the FDA. And, uh, and at one point, we have a design that, that, that works well. We have a 3D print of it. We have everybody try it, and everybody is able to use it, to charge it magnetically on top of the, on top of the device, except for that one guy. So there's a man who comes in, and he sees the, the 3D print of, of our design. It says, there is no way I can, I can target that. There's no way I can put the, the, the watch on top of that. And we're like, well, how about you try? And then we see him, he tries, he tries, he tries again, and he fails again. And, um, and after he leaves, we, we look at each other and we're like, well, it worked for everybody else. So do we make the decision to go forward with this design or do we decide to design for this one man? And so after a little bit of reflection, we re realized that if we don't design for him, like who do we really design for? So we came back to our drawing boards and then came up with this funnel design. Um, he came back a couple of weeks later, new 3D prints. He comes in, he looks at the design and then he says, did you change the design just for me? And then we said, yes. And that's when he started crying. And then, um, and then, then we really realized that we made the right decision. You know, he was able to very easily put the the watch inside the charger, um, you know, without even thinking about it. And then, and then that's when we knew that we we made the right decision. We did the same thing with packaging. You know, you can't have a product that's easy to use, easy to replace, but the packaging being very very difficult to open. So same thing here. Um, so this product was, you know, very, very, like solved so many problems. It's actually the first to, first product to market to actually um, be FDA approved and, and help alleviate uh, the, the symptoms of uh, essential tremors. So right after the product was launched, uh, the company CalHealth actually got 50 million in Series C funding. So here, you know, if, if you have uh, anything to learn from this whole experience is that don't design for personas, which is something that they teach you in a lot in like user experience classes, design classes is, um, I, I don't really believe in personas. I do believe in design for real people with non-ideal behaviors. And you really have to spend the time with them, asking them what's, what actually works for them. Um, next, we're gonna talk about a good design has a point of view. Um, that's that's like my lifetime fight. Uh, I see a lot of the same stuff. You know, having been in this career for about 15 years, there's a lot of black things. It's a lot of the same 15 materials. It's a lot of um, you know the same point of view, the same shapes, the same uh, ways of thinking about things, the same ways of manufacturing. And I really want here to you know make a point that there's there there are other ways. And the way we're going to do it is by uh, designing African tech for Africans. So this company called Kaya, I'm also a partner at the, at the company. Uh, we realize that you know people who live in different countries in Africa, North Africa, South Africa, East and West, um, have. Uh, live very differently from people in the U.S. or people in Asia, right? Where most of the consumer electronics come from, and when when you design things in the U.S., you know, think, uh, you know, all the Googles and Amazon and Facebook products of the world are are really serving the average, you know, like the 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 
they're, they're not taking too much risk. They want they want to fit as, in as many homes as possible. It doesn't really have a point of view. Um, so so we actually wanted to do the opposite for for Africa because Africa has so many languages, so many types of cultures, so many types of personality, even within you know a region. And um, and so so we really want to open that that concept to 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 a lot more people. Uh, so you know. The, the first part that we're going to do is, you know, really integrating, um, you know, smart speakers um, and uh, and integrating, you know, beautiful materials like wood and color and and really getting that warmth and that that uh, that flavor that is really missing from consumer electronics today. Um, there's a lot more that comes after this. I can only show this at this point, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fun. And as a soft launch. You know, we, we, we launched the products and got a lot of, you know, followers kind of instantly about people in Africa really being excited about something that not only is going to be um, to be designed for them, but is also going to 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 um, to help develop. Uh, you know, tech in Africa by, you know, creating new job opportunities, by, uh, you know, integrating a lot of people's point of view from different regions, et cetera, et cetera. So here, um, you know, the pro tip is please don't design for the average, design for the exceptional and design for the culturally rich. The last project I want to go over is um, how good design empowers people. Uh, so this project is pretty amazing. So we got asked uh, to design a new educational system for Singapore. And, um, you know, if you if you think of a lot of schools, probably the school you went to as a kid, it was probably a rectilinear type of building. Fun fact, a lot of schools are actually designed by, um, by, by the same architects who design prisons, and that explains a lot. So here we wanted to create a, a system where um, you, you, you have to have, you have children and adults and everybody in the same environment and really getting what they need um, um, from that environment. And so here we have, you know, furniture that's designed, um, you know, to, 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 to welcome them, but also giving them the opportunity to create the products for themselves and create a responsibility for themselves, whether it's growing food, cleaning after themselves, building things, furniture, etc. And playing is the same, unstructured play, creating this environment using different textures and colors and having them hack it uh, digitally, physically, uh, having them, you know, sell the wonderful products that they design for themselves. And then here, you know, um, what, what we create is basically a website that allows kids to create uh, the furniture that they need, you know, in the size that they need, with the aesthetics that they need, the materials that they want, etc. And really integrating a lot of really, really cool materials that we don't get to use in, um, you know, mass manufacturing, you know, reclaimed woods, precious plastics, cow dung plastic, biodegradable plastic, bacteria dyed textile, etc. Really, really cool things that are going to inspire this next generation of people whether they're creative or not, to really think about where things come from and how they use it and where it goes after you're done using it. And uh, so, yeah, so the website would kind of look like this where, um, you know, you get to choose things. It's, it's very straightforward, it's a lot of, like drag and drop and, uh, and really putting the child in the center of, you know, the, the, way, the way humans consume things. So, so a lot of people in tech have been talking about bias, right? And and to me, the best way to 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 fight bias is to um, you know empower people to personalize things for themselves. So to finish this presentation, um, um, I would like to give a little word of advice to all the startup founders, um, and um, it's very simple, you know. Um, I would like for all of you to think about doing less. Don't try to solve all the problems at once. Uh, whatever problem you, you're solving, like really centralize it as much as you can. Do less, and then after you do that, do it better, better than everybody else. Do it for the first time, doing using technologies that's, that's really bringing something to the world. And then after you've done it better, go ahead and do more. Do, you know, um, expand to, to more products under your line or really become the experts in the world in that one category you've, you've worked on. And after you've done more, you, you can, you know, feel free to do what feels right to you, what is aligned with your purpose on this planet, uh, regardless of what people tell you, right? I've spent an entire career disagreeing with everybody, but, but that's, how, that's how I was able to do everything that you've seen in this presentation. So um, a little bit about, um, you know, what, what I do outside of, of, um, of um, designing products for our clients. 
uh, I love free information. So a lot of uh, questions are not answered on the internet when it comes to hardware. So uh, with my partner, Martis and I, we created a series of uh, videos called Future Future. If you go on YouTube and type in nonfiction design, you'll find it. And uh, we talk about uh, demystifying design. We talk about product development. We talk about the future of every industry. So uh, yeah, please subscribe. Um, and then uh, once a month, we have an AMA session. Actually, this month is going to be tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, you can go on Eventbrite. The event is free. You go in, you sign up for 15 minutes, you come in and you ask us any question for 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. And uh, people have gotten a lot of um, good advice from that, hopefully. So that is it on my end. Wow. What a roller coaster. We had people tearing up in the comments. I'm all fired up, excited. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I, I, have, I have no concept of design myself, I've, but I think I've been pretty honest with folks that I'm brand new to this hardware thing in general. So I really appreciate you sharing all that. Uh, one thing that struck me, and we got great questions, but one thing that struck me was when I think about design, I've always thought of it as a very right brain exercise and you know it's making things look great and being creative and paint swatches and golden ratio um but then in in this context there's also so much left brain kind of engineering stuff that's logical and analytical um how do good designers and entrepreneurs kind of balance those two uh it starts with education um, so, uh, one of the reasons why I, 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 I taught until, until recently is, uh, because I was seeing that gap, right? A lot of designers were only interested in one aspect of things, whether it's the left brain or the right brain, uh, aspect of things. And, and I don't see them as separate, actually, technically, that's not how the brain works anyway. But, um, um, a good designer is someone who is not necessarily good at both, but at least is is open to listen to people on the other side, right? You, ha you, have to, you have to learn new things all the time. You cannot go in the world and say, I know everything and I'm just going to you know, apply the same process to everything that I do for the next 20 years. Design is not only something that's left brain, right brain, but something that evolves over time constantly. There's new technology, there's new tools, there's new way of thinking, there's um, more priorities that, um, that users are, are, are conscious about uh, that we have to be uh, aware of and we have to integrate in our design. You know, we have to do more with less and, um, and, and you know, include include the dialogue in, in the process. I, I actually have no idea how people work without dialogue, right? I, I see a lot of designers who are like, oh, you know, it's the engineer's job to just do what I design. Well, good luck with that. Um, that's, you know, um, yeah. you're setting yourself for disappointments. Um, and, 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 and same thing for the engineers, right? The engineers have to be um, open-minded about it too. Um, the, the way I describe it is uh, we, we have experienced three types of engineers. The, the no engineers who say no to everything, regardless of how you know, simple it is. There's the yes engineers who will say yes to everything because their boss tells them so and you know, they have to get the contract and all that. And our favorite types of engineers are the yes but engineers. People yeah. who say yes, we can do that, but here's the caveat. Here's what, what we have to uh, be aware of before making the next decision. So, so I, I recommend everybody to question everything and to work with yes but people. Yeah. And it seems like you put a lot of folks in uh, kind of developing the right team. So that's good to hear. Uh, Thomas Lee asked, how do you validate your designs? So it depends on, um, on, on, on what we're doing. For example, the human headphones, um, we had to validate things you know, in, in, in buckets. So we had to validate the ergonomics first. So we, we did this whole process of, you know, secure fit 3D printing, human testing, um, and, and 3D CAD, you know, circle again and again until we were able to do the handstand that I showed. And then once that was done, uh, you know, we, we started working on, you know, what kind of components, uh, custom components need to fit in that environment. Uh, so, so yeah, working very closely with mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, making sure that everything works, uh, that usability is um, is adequate at all times. And then once you're done with that, you move on to you know manufacturing, EBT, DBT, PBT. PBT. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's take on small jobs, solve them one by one, but all always be aware of what comes ahead. Sure. 
Um, so Hans asked, today only about 20% of electronics waste gets recycled. How do you approach design to make a product greener and more recyclable? So there, there are multiple things that you, you can do. Um, one, you know, one that's been done by, by, by bigger companies, I guess, is uh, design for disassembly. Uh, it's, that's, that's more valuable for products a little bit simpler, you know, not too many parts or parts that are very easy to separate. Uh, that's one. Uh, using materials that are recyclable, uh, like truly recyclable, and, and recycling is, is a little bit difficult because it really depends on the on the uh, region you're in, right? You can have the same material be recycled in the in the west coast of the U.S., but not in the middle. You know, it's it really depends. And the infrastructure, um, you know, is it is it a product that is recycled by your city or is it recycled by the company that has sold you the product? Um, there, there there are both options as well. Um, and and you know, also there's a lot of like things that sound eco-friendly but actually are not so you have to be very transparent about um about um the decisions that you make right if if you have uh, something made out of cardboard you know that looks very cardboardy and eco-friendly and all that and then you put a bunch of varnish on it like that that kills it completely if if you have uh, a product that's made out of an eco-friendly plastic and you put a bunch of you know um paint on it or a bunch of uh, uh, I don't know, soft touch or whatever, it's, 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 it's not recyclable anymore. So, so yeah, you have to, there's a lot of different decisions that you make to, to actually ensure that things are actually recyclable or, or more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, from Harmon Baines, uh, a very regular viewer. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of open source design and the circular economy? Um, the idea that we make stuff that ends up turning into feedstock for other products in a cycle. No, that that's great. Um, the the thing you have to be aware of when you when you um, you know cycle things around is that the quality changes. For example, if you if you have a raw plastic that becomes a product and that product is broken down uh, to become a new recycled material that becomes another product. Um, the, the quality of the, the structure of the plastic changes. And, and that's okay for some products, right? Not every product needs to be you know, super high tech or uh, very resistant to, to, uh, to impact or whatever, right? So, so yeah, making, making products that don't need to be high tech out of new materials, I think should be an obsolete way of doing things, but it really depends on supply chain, right? It's uh, the it's cost of things. Uh, re recycling, recycled and upcycled materials is still very expensive because the number is not as high as, uh, as regular materials. Um, circular economy, uh, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a big one. I, I'm currently involved in a company that's trying to do that for the world of fashion by, um, you know, integrating, um, you know, compostable type of materials, um, making sure that shipping is like a uh, very short distance, uh, that um, people only fabricate what uh, the cons consumers already bought. And it's going to change a lot of, uh, of the standard of, of uh, consumption that people have today. Uh, it's, it's gonna be an uphill battle, but I believe that um, you know, there, there are ways of doing that. Um, you know, using technology for fabrication today, that um, like, you know, 3D printing, that's getting better and better by the minute. Um, and, 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 and really, and also, you know, over the last 10 years, I, I would say um, minimum order quantities uh, standards have changed a lot. I think back in the day, if you came to a company and said you wanted less than 50,000 units of something, they would laugh at you. And now you ask for five or 10,000, that's completely normal. Um, good for you guys. Um, it's, it's, you know, things are changing. Um, technology is allowing us to do, to do things in, in, uh, in more reasonable quantities. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I guess hopefully the earth will, will thank us for it eventually. A uh, question I really like from Delphine Bruntieri, which I've got wrong, I'm sure. Uh, what is a design trend that needs to disappear? Uh, it's funny, I, I'm not super, I mean, I am aware of trends, but it's not really something I think about a lot. Um, I think if, if I relate to the presentation I give, um, like that trend of making things as 
as like I would say boring. So so here's here, here's an interesting thing. I've been on a couple of panels where people are like, oh, I'm tired of all those masculine products. And I'm like, masculine, what do you mean by that? Uh, what, what what they actually mean is that, oh, it's like black things that, mm -hmm. you know, with silver trims and, you know, always the same cheap stuff that you've mm -hmm. seen. Uh, for the last decades. And to me, that's not masculine because the play of masculine products that are really beautiful. Uh, to me, that's just boring or lazy or, you know, not trying, not, not taking any risks. Um, and, and that has become the standard, you know, even if, even if you see, you know, more, um, more colors or more, you know, light, um, you know, white, light grays appearing in the last few years is still, is still quite neutral mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not taking enough risks. So I, yeah, as a general a trend, I'd like to eliminate is that, that default of the boring colorway. Yeah. And in a way that kind of, that kind of links back to your pro tip around don't design for the average design for the exceptional. I think that yeah. maybe there's room for folks to design for uh, more risk taking customers. And I think sometimes it can be to default and, and assume the worst about customers. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, Booty Mulia, who attends all of these, thanks for tuning in again, uh, asks, are there times when goals and missions of good design principles might not align with profitability, and what do you do when that happens? Uh, yes, all the time. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's always, you know, a, a give and take. Um, I'm not willing to give up every single one of our ideas. I'm willing to give up a couple and it's a negotiation, right? It's the same way a, an engineer negotiates with you. Like, can we move this line this way? Um, uh, it, it, it really depends. Um, and, and it's the more experience you have, the more you know how things are fabricated, uh, what it takes, how much it costs, who can actually fabricate them, uh, the more you can make the right decision. Sometimes the decision is 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 to eliminate that idea completely. Um, sometimes it's to to do it halfway or to set it up so the next product has it all the way. Um, so so yeah, it's and I always think of clients uh, we, we design for as long term partners, right? Things we cannot do for the next product. Uh, let's try to think it for the next generation of product after that. Yes, and speaking of those customers, how early do you solicit feedback from them in the design process? Um, we like to work with our clients. Mm -hmm. So um, I know it's very different from a lot of design studios who like to disappear for like a couple of months and then say, ta-da, you know, here's this amazing thing that may It's may perfect. Um, not, not into that. I, I, that that's one thing that our clients really, really appreciate about us is that we have them in the room. You know, whether we listen to them or not is another thing. But, but at least they're here. At least they know what the process is. Uh, at least they, they, um, uh, they, they understand why we're making the decisions we're making. So, so it's never a huge surprise. Um, but, but when you have your clients part of the process, they're a lot more willing to, to bend to new ideas, right? Because everybody has preconceived ideas about what something should be. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of us are not designers. Um, and designers have the ability to go far in the future and close to reality and then, and then you know, go cheap and then go expensive and, and then constantly moving in that space that we need to, to, to create in and, and eventually come up with something that makes sense as much as possible, but also you know, fits the market, but also excites uh, the, you know, the people who are going to use this product. So, so, so that's, that's the hard thing about design is to convince Convince people around you um, that that thing that doesn't exist yet, that hopefully nobody else on this planet has thought of for this industry, um, is going to work. Okay, uh, Alexandra Hammerberg uh, asks: uh, Do you have a method for balancing designing for current behaviors versus designing towards changing behaviors of the user? And she gives the example of curved pathways that people kind of follow naturally versus right angle pathways that everybody just kind of cuts corners on all the time. Yeah, I mean, there, there's like psychology behind uh, behavior change, right? You, you don't um, you, you don't create something completely new that is based on nothing that the person experiences every day, right? Uh, so, so sometimes it's baby steps. Uh, sometimes it's um, 
uh, the, the, the connection of two environments that typically are not together, but you're very familiar with, and then you connect them together. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like high level thinking about this, but, but it's, it's about welcoming, right? Everything is about welcoming. You, you welcome your client to think your way. You welcome your customer to, um, to, to, to adopt this new behavior that you created for them and you make it easy for them. You make it very intuitive. You make it, um, um, you know, um, encouraging to come back to. Because the behavior, you, you may be able to learn something from the first time, but you may not be compelled to use it again and again. And that's actually a huge problem with medical products. We've realized over time, working with a lot of, you know, wearables uh, that we have to put through the FDA, that a lot of people are actually willing to suffer instead of uh, adopting a new behavior. Um, that's because it's inconvenient for them to charge a device once a week, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and that's exactly the type of problems that we have to solve as designers, right? Um, as that's equal to the technology that has been um, um, introduced to them. So really, when, when, you, when you try to change behaviors um, in, in new products, you have to think about how people actually live. People are lazy. That's a fact. I'm lazy. Um, people don't like to learn new things. People are used to, um, um, to, to, to doing things a certain way. They don't want, they don't want an inconvenience uh, in their life. Now, if they have an epiphany and find something that is much more um, uh, uh, pleasurable, but also more practical than anything before, then their behavior changes instantly. And then they think of what they've been using for the last five years as completely obsolete. obsolete. And, and that's, the, that's what's happening with your cell phone, for example. Everybody uh, three years ago thought their you know, smartphone was you know, the latest and greatest. And if you had to use it today again, uh, now that you've upgraded, um, you, you think it's too slow or it's too weird or you know, the design is, is, is too, too dated. So, so the way we change behaviors can go very, very fast. And as designers, we get to control that. So you're the one pulling the strings in my life. Oh. Great to know. Um, two rapid fire questions. We're out of time. Uh, one, who was the fashion company that you mentioned? Oh, uh, for circular design? Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Positive Fibers. Okay. And do you have engineers on staff or do you contract that out? Uh, we, uh, we have a partner company that we, we, we use their engineers for everything. They're, they're fantastic. Uh, yeah, some of the people on our staff have backgrounds in engineering, but that's mm -hmm. not what they do here. Perfect. Yeah. Um, well, that is what we have time for on the questions. Thank you for everybody who submitted some. I know we didn't get to everybody again, but we do try our best. Um, I want to thank uh, Phnom as well for sharing uh, your wisdom with the group. This was fantastic, thought-provoking, um, something we have not covered before, and it's great to, to, to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, reminder for next week, we'll be hearing from Ryan Shimizu, the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Igor Institute, and he's going to be presenting hardware versus software is a false choice. Uh, I asked him to talk about the difference in hardware and software entrepreneurship, and he told me that's nah, not really like that. So we'll hear about that. So sign up and we'll see you next week. Also, make sure you sign up for Hans's IoT Hub meetup group and join the Discord server. Uh, I think we're going to get great community there, a uh, great way to meet more folks. So again, thank you everybody for joining. Please reach out to me if you wanna talk about our incubator, what we're building, ways to get involved. If you have ideas for speakers, if you have ideas for other events, we would love to hear all that. We're building this for you guys. So we would love to hear your thoughts. So again, thank you, Phnom. Thank you to Hans, the co-host as well. And we'll see everybody next week.